It's a question to contemplate and think. Who or what do you trust? Who or what do you trust? You know, back in the 60s, if you were to poll Americans and say, who do you trust? Guess who people would have said they trusted? Walter Cronkite. Walter Cronkite. If, if it was on the CBS Evening News, it must be the truth. That's right. People trusted Walter Cronkite. He was the most trusted public figure, Walter Cronkite. You know, today, if you ask people who they trust for information, uh, the news media is not enjoying the stellar reputation that it used to enjoy decades ago. In fact, 30%, uh, I shouldn't say 30%, just as many, those under the age of 30, trust social media, information they get from social media, as much or more than they trust what they read in a newspaper or get from some national media source. In fact, as the Pew Research Center has been doing polls over the years, tracking Americans' level of trust in news media, they've, they've noticed a trend. While 56 people, I'd rather say 56 people, that sounds about right, while 56% of people say they trust what they hear in national news, every year that percentage is falling. So next year it's likely it will be even less than 56%. And at the same time, the level of trust in what people read on Facebook or on Twitter or X or whatever it's called these days is increasing. So there is an inverse relationship as people's trust in national news media drops, they're replacing where they're getting information from and what they trust by what they read on social media. So the more people interface with social media, the more they trust what they're reading there and the less they trust what they're getting from national news media. An interesting phenomena, while people's level of trust is falling as it relates to what they read from national news media, their level of trust in local news media is actually gradually increasing. So in other words, half of Americans might open up a newspaper, and if it's USA Today, they're probably not going to trust it all that much. But if it's the local newspaper, and it's a story from a local reporter, they're much more likely to believe it and to trust what is being shared. In, in other words, the closer the source of information is to the reader, the more they trust it. If it's from somebody they know or they're fairly adjacent to, someone from their local community, or even if it's online social media, somebody they feel that they know because they've been reading their posts for uh, months or years even, they're going to trust it more. But if it's information from a distant figure, they're much less likely to believe it, much less likely to trust it. You know, the same holds true for God's word. The same holds true from God's word. We believe as Christians that God's word is reliable and trustworthy and dependable. And as Gavin just read in 2 Timothy, we believe, as the Bible states, that indeed God's word is exactly that. It's God's word. It has come from God. And it is good, it is reliable, it is dependable. And you noted there what Gavin read in 2 Timothy 3.16, given by inspiration of God and is profitable. It is good for doctrine. Doctrine is simply what we believe about God. Teaching, doctrine, it's good for reproof and correction. And the difference between reproof and correction is simply this. When you're doing something wrong, and someone points it out to you, and you already knew it was wrong, you're being reproved. Because you're willfully doing something you know to be wrong, and so you're being reproved. 
But if you're doing something wrong, you don't know it's wrong, and someone points it out to you, you're being corrected because you're not willfully doing what is wrong. You simply were ignorant. That's the difference between reproof and correction, and God's word is good for both. And also for instruction in righteousness. Righteousness is simply right doing. God's word is good for all of that. In fact, God's word not only is good for that, God's word is essential. It is necessary for us as we are living in this world to have something we can trust, something we can depend on, something we can rely on, something that we believe. And God's word is that and even more. But sometimes, sometimes God's word can feel or seem distant from us. And the more distant a source of information is, the less likely we are to believe and to trust it. Sometimes even the source of information is close to us. For some reason or another, we choose to disbelieve it. I remember years ago when I was just a boy, my father and brother and I went and spent a week down in the southern part of Texas, not too far from the Texas-Mexico border, and we spent some time digging for Indian artifacts. My dad had a friend who was an amateur archaeologist, and he was doing a dig down here on this ranch in southern Texas. And we, we you know, made this nice grid in the area we were digging, and these one foot by one foot grids, or maybe three foot by three foot, I don't remember exactly what it was, and we would, we would dig through the soil very carefully, and then we would sift through it to make sure we weren't missing anything. And if we found something, it had to be noted where exactly we found it. We put it in a little bag, it would be given a number, and then it was being, going to be given to the state of Texas. And they were going to handle these artifacts that we discovered in our little archaeological dig. Well, after a week of digging, guess what we found? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And one day, my dad and I went out for a little hike. And when we were coming back from our hike, my brother was waving his arms and shouting. And what he was shouting was, I found an arrowhead. And when we got back and he told us the story, he said he was walking down the path to the stream that was close to the cabin we were staying in, and there was an arrowhead just sitting on the path, and he picked it up. And my response was, I don't believe you. I thought for sure he was playing a joke on us. Maybe he had found it somewhere else. Maybe we were doing the archaeological dig and he slipped it in his pocket to, to you know, have a grand reveal later in some dramatic way. I didn't believe him. And my dad's friend said, no, this is actually what happened. And I told him, you don't know my brother like I do. <laughs> well. I was wrong. He was right. He had actually found an arrowhead just sitting there on the path as he was walking down to the creek. Sometimes we choose to disbelieve what we should believe. Sometimes when we read the promises of God's word, we say, yeah, I don't know. You know, it doesn't seem like maybe that's really the way God works. That's maybe not been my experience. Sometimes we even choose to distrust God's word. But how is it? as Christians, as believers, living in what we believe to be the closing days, the closing scenes of earth's history. How is it that we can help people? How is it we can help people to have a faith and trust and dependence on God's word so that everyone can have a source, a solid foundation? a place they trust and depend on and build their lives on. Because as the research has shown, the farther away the source of information is, the less likely people are to trust it. And, and in just a visible, physical sense, if we think about how far away heaven is, then the source of this book will, to those who don't know God, seem to be very far away indeed. And their likeliness to trust this book diminishes as they view God as someone who is, who is far away. It was in the last book of the Bible that we find a passage that I think teaches us some lessons about how it is that we can 
help people to learn to trust and depend on God's word. Revelation chapter 12, Revelation begins by saying this is a revelation of Jesus Christ. And so while we find um, strange time periods and strange beasts and cataclysmic apocalyptic events in the book of Revelation, it can be sometimes scary and unsettling for people to read through the final book of the Bible. It opens by telling us this is here to teach us about Jesus, to help us to see him and to know him and to trust him. Is in Revelation chapter 12, a chapter that describes a great battle that takes place between the forces of good and the forces of evil. A battle that starts indeed in heaven and results in Satan, this dragon, this snake of old, being thrown out of heaven along with a third of the angels. And it's as this book traces, as chapter 12 traces, this continued conflict between God and Satan, between good and evil, Satan focuses his fury on God's people. In Revelation 12, describes how Satan seeks to wipe out faithful followers of God, how God provides for and protects and sustains his people. But it's at the very end of Revelation 12, Revelation 12, verse 17, that we find this verse. The dragon was wroth, I'm reading from the King James Version of the Bible, wroth or was angry with the woman. I guess we should pause there for just a moment. The woman is introduced early in Revelation chapter 12, and the woman is a symbol for God's people. So the dragon is angry with God's people and went to make war with the remnant of her seed or the rest of her offspring, or the descendants of God's people. Think about back in Bible times, who were God's people? The Jewish nation. They were chosen by God. They were God's people. The descendants of, of God's people are those who have down through the centuries been faithful to Jesus Christ. It's no longer a nation that is chosen as God's people, but it's whomever will choose to follow Jesus. That's what Paul said, then then we are descendants of Abraham indeed, if we are following Christ. And so the remnant of her seed or the rest of her offspring are simply down through the centuries those who have been faithful to Jesus. They are God's people, and Satan is angry with them, and they're described in these ways. They're the remnant or the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. God's people are described as keeping, as hanging on to God's commandments and having the testimony of Jesus Christ. God's people described with those two characteristics. What does it mean when it says the commandments of God and the testimonies of Jesus? Well, if you look through the book of Revelation, you will find that the commandments of God and the word of God are synonymous. Look up every time. Do that this afternoon, maybe if you have a few minutes, and just look through Revelation. The commandments of God, the word of God, they're synonymous. You can go to uh, Psalm chapter 19. Psalm chapter 19 describes, in the second half of Psalm 19, it uses multiple terms to refer to the Word of God. The commandments of God, the judgments of God, the instructions of God, simply what comes from God. Those are His commands. Those are His instructions. We see them most clearly distilled in the Ten Commandments. Ten immutable principles that God has communicated to His people that guide us in our lives, his instructions for the life we live. Jesus, of course, noted that that there are even two commands that are the the, the most concentrated distillation of God's instruction to us. Remember what those are? Love God with all your heart and love your neighbor. In fact, in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy, it's love your neighbor as yourself. But then John chapter 13, Jesus raises it a notch. He says, this is how people will know that you're my disciples, if you have love one for another. He says, if you love one another as I have loved you, as Jesus loved us. So as Christians, we have the privilege of not simply loving others 
as we love ourselves, but loving others as Jesus loves us. That is really the foundation of God's government, love. So loving God and loving others. And everything that God shares with us in the Bible is an amplification of that principle of love. God invites us to be those who keep his commandments that live lives of love. The commandments of God, the testimony of Jesus. And we see this, of course, throughout, throughout Scripture. When, when you and I, when we choose to obey God, Acts chapter 5 says that the Holy Spirit is given to those who obey him. As we obey God, we open our lives up more to his presence. Think about this. Um, as, as a parent or as a kid, when do you have the best relationship? between a parent and a kid? Is it when there is defiance and disrespect and disobedience? Is that those moments when you look back and think like, wow, we just had the best relationship? Uh, think about your childhood. If you were yelling at your parents, do you look back at those moments and say, that's when it was the best in our home? No, when is it the best? When do you have the best relationship? when there is, as a, as a child, respect for and obedience to your parents, right? When you're obeying the laws, the rules at home, things are much better. You can have a wonderful relationship. And it's the same way with us and God. When we're choosing to obey him, to respect him, that's when we have the best relationship. That's when our lives are flooded with, with love. And we can be focused on obedience as a legalistic requirement. Or we can look at obedience as a way for us to communicate our love to Jesus. As Jesus said himself in John 14, if you love me, you'll obey me. You'll keep my commandments. And so God's people, they are choosing to hang on to, to keep God's commandments, God's instructions. Everything that God has told us, we want to do. That's what the Israelites said. Everything you've said, Lord, we will do. Of course, the problem was, they determined to do that all on their own. Yes, God says it. You stay up there on Mount Sinai, God. We'll be down here obeying you, and everything will work out well. But the problem was, of course, that their hearts had not been changed. They hadn't allowed God to give them that new heart. And that's what we need. If we're going to keep God's commandments, if we are going to obey Jesus, then we need him to give us a new heart. And really, if, if you and I are descendants of God's people, if we're part of his nation, we have a changed heart. That's, that's what makes the difference. It's not something we're born into physically. We can't say, well, because I'm a descendant of George Reed, then I am part of God's family because he is a Christian, I'm a Christian. No, that's not how it works. We have to be born again. We have to be born into God's family, and that's a choice that you and I make. God gives us a new heart. He transforms our desires, and we want, then, to obey and follow God. God's people, in the last days, they're under tremendous assault from Satan. But when someone looks at them, they say, that's someone who loves God. That's someone who is obeying Jesus, is hanging on to God's commandments. In Revelation, God's commandments and God's word are synonymous. And if you look through Revelation, you'll, di you'll discover that. God's word and God's commandments. In fact, throughout Revelation, we'll see the commandments of God and or the word of God almost always connected with the testimony of Jesus or the faith of Jesus. God's word, God's commandments, and the testimony or the faith of Jesus. Those are coupled up all throughout Revelation. And I think it's in that pairing that we actually find the secret, not the secret, but a principle for how it is we can help people gain trust and confidence in God's word. In Revelation chapter 12, Revelation chapter 12, God's people are being persecuted. And it's in verse 11 that we find something remarkable. Verse 11, speaking about God's people who are being persecuted by Satan, and it says, they, the people of God, overcame him, that Satan, by the blood of the lamb, who's the lamb? That's Jesus, and 
by the word of their testimony. There's something powerful about your story, about your testimony of what God has done in your life. When we think about the testimony of Jesus, that word testimony shows up in the New Testament 37 times. 37 times. 30 of those show up in the writings of John. This is a major theme in the writings of John. Interestingly enough, commandments shows up 67 times in the New Testament, 30 of those, almost half of them, in the writings of John. That should be no surprise because John is called the apostle of love. That's the, the predominant theme in his writings, love, love, love. And we know love and obedience to God go hand in hand. And so it's no surprise that commandments would be a major theme, but testimony is as well. The testimony of Jesus, the testimony of the saints, the witness of God's people. And when we think about this testimony, this witness, what is it? A testimony, a witness is simply a proclamation of what someone knows or has experienced themselves. It's in 1 John, let's go over there together, we'll be back in Revelation in a minute, but 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 10. He that believes, 1 John 5, 10, he that believes on the Son of God has the witness in himself. That word witness is the same as the word testimony in Revelation 12. The one who believes has the witness or the testimony in himself. He that believes not God hath made him a liar because he believes not the record that God gave of his son. And this is the record that God has given to us eternal life and this life is in his son. Did you notice something here? He who believes on the son of God has the witness or the testimony where? In himself. When you believe in Jesus, when you choose to give your life to Jesus, you have a witness. Romans, uh, Paul in Romans says that it's actually the Spirit of God testifies or witnesses with your spirit. There's something that happens in your heart, and you have a testimony in your life of what Jesus has done for you. There is the testimony, the witness that you have in yourself, and then also, verse 11 says, there is the record. That's also a testimony. That's also a testimony, but it's the testimony that is outside of yourself. You have a testimony within yourself, and there's a testimony or a record outside of yourself. What is the record that we have about Jesus? It's the Bible. This is the record that we have about Jesus. So you have a testimony or a witness in your life when you know Jesus and you walk with him. It's your personal story, your personal experience, your testimony of what Jesus has done for you. That is something that is unique and special to you alone. And you also have a record. You have a testimony outside of yourself, the word of God, the inspired word of God, that is also a witness to what God has done, to what Jesus has done. You know, sometimes you don't remember things correctly. Did you know that? Sometimes I don't remember things correctly. When I was a kid, my dad and I were part of a polar bear camping um, program that was, ironically enough, um, sponsored by the Southern, the, the Southern California Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. Now, you would think, Southern California, how are you going to do any polar bear camping in Southern California? But there are mountains, and up in the mountains, there would be snow in the winter, and there was a group of pathfinders that would get together, and we were learning how to winter camp. And we would go up to the youth camp, and we were learning all about that. Well, we went up one weekend, and we were doing some rock climbing and repelling on a cliff. There was about an 80-foot cliff and having a good time until, unfortunately, somebody fell. He wasn't tied in. He was doing some free climbing, and he fell all the way to the bottom. And, of course, it was a devastating event. Uh, one that is seared into, into my memory. I was standing right there and, and saw this young man, just a boy just a couple years older than I am, go tumbling down this, this cliff. 
And a helicopter came, and, and um, he was airlifted. And unfortunately, while he lived, he was terribly injured. Injuries that, physical injuries, yes, um, but just deeply impacted. His life was never going to be the same again. And, and a couple years later, his parents decided to sue um, the, the church that, who owned the youth camp um, alleging that, that things weren't done properly and there was some liability or fault there. And I don't know actually what the outcome of that was, but I do remember that a lawyer contacted my dad and said, we need to come take a deposition from both you and your son. And so a year and a half or so after this event, I remember after school one day sitting down in my classroom at the church school across the table from a lawyer and she began asking me questions about what I remembered from that day. And something remarkable was uncovered, that I remembered things differently than everybody else. That even the sequence of events in my mind were different, was different than what other people remembered. And as she was asking me questions, she, she began to say, only say what you're sure of. Only say what you're sure of. And I would say, I am sure that this is what happened. And she would, um, well, she couldn't do it during the deposition, but once the deposition was over, she told me, no, this is not, this is, look at here, so-and-so said this happened and then that, and you said, no, that wasn't the way it was. I remembered, I thought perfectly but I didn't remember accurately. Oftentimes in our lives, our experience, our memory, the way we process and understand what has happened in our lives, oftentimes it's not accurate. And even, even our witness, our testimony of God's working in our lives, we could get it wrong. It's so subjective. Your witness, your experience is subjective. There could be things that happen in your life that if all you had was your witness, your testimony, your personal journey, you may walk away with an inaccurate view of God. You might begin to believe something that's not what the Bible teaches. And so God says, look at your own personal witness, your own personal testimony is important. I mean, it is by sharing your testimony that you can stand strong against Satan. That's one of the ways, one of the tools God has given us to overcome the devil. But Jesus said it's not enough to have the witness in yourself. We also need the record, the Word of God, the inspired testimony of Jesus that we find, an objective testimony of Jesus that we can compare our own experience to an objective witness that we trust, that we believe, that is reliable and dependable, and that is God's word. In fact, as you look through the book of Revelation, you discover that the testimony of Jesus is both. The testimony of Jesus is your personal experience with Jesus. The testimony you have about Jesus and what he's done in your life, and that's important. That needs to be shared and talked about. Through you sharing your story, you lift Jesus up. And by remembering how God has worked in your life in the past, you'll be strengthened. Your faith will grow. But we also need the objective witness or testimony of Jesus. We need the inspired word of God. And that's also the testimony of Jesus in the book of Revelation. In fact, Revelation 19.10 says the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. It is the means through which the Holy Spirit, as we know from God's word, moved holy men of God to speak and to record this book, this inspired word of God. This is the testimony of Jesus. We can read it and we can believe it, and we can know that it is true. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13, the Apostle Paul outlines different spiritual ministries in the church, and the gift of prophecy is actually one of those that Paul says will continue on through the end of time. 
And so as Bible-believing Christians, we build our faith on God's Word. There is nothing that equals the Word of God. We study it, we treasure it, we memorize it, we follow it. We know this is dependable. But because we believe what the Bible tells us, we want to be open to any means through which God chooses to communicate with us. And God says, hey, he'll send prophets that we have to compare to Scripture, but we want to be open to what God shares with us. You know, oftentimes in the Adventist church when we say spirit of prophecy, we're referencing specifically the ministry of Ellen White. We believe that God spoke to her in a special way and, and shared messages with us to point us back to the Bible. In fact, you know, you look through the Bible, and if God's people had believed and followed everything that God told them through Moses, you know how many books the Bible would have? Five. Maybe not even five, maybe even less. But the five books of Moses, that's, that's what God initially shared with his people. But what was the problem? God's people forgot what God had communicated to them. And so God had to send another prophet, right? And did the prophet have new information? Most of the time, not. Sometimes there was more insight to share, but most of the time what the prophet said was, you're forgetting to do what God already told you. A prophet reminded God's people about what God had, had told them. And it should be the same way with any prophets in modern time today, whether we think of the ministry of Ellen White or we look and, and say someone who maybe has a special message from God today, it should be in accordance with the Bible. It should be pointing us back to the Bible. It should be lifting up Jesus. As we think about the testimony of Jesus, we have what we might say the personal testimony of Jesus. It's your experience with Jesus, and that's powerful and that's needed. And God wants you to think about it and remember it and share it to lift Jesus up. And there is the official record, the objective testimony of Jesus that we find in God's word. And that's the standard. That's the test. Our own experience, we compare to the Bible and say we want to be in accordance with God's word. And as you and I experience both, as we treasure both, our faith grows. And here's the thing, is, is people around us are looking for something close that they can rely on and trust and depend upon. When they see God's word lived out in your life and mine, someone who's close, someone they know and they see the power of God in your life and mine, that's the best witness. That's the best witness to the existence of God, the love of God, the reliability of God's word. When it's something close, because, you see, we trust what's closest to us. And through your life, people can be close to God. Some years back when I was in college, I was working in what we called the box factory, although we didn't actually make anything. We just sorted through cartons and collapsed boxes and got rid of the old ones and, and stacked up the ones that were still in good shape. But we called it the box factory. And it was somewhat solitary work because there would be someone feeding boxes onto this sequence of about eight conveyor belts stacked one on top of the other. And then on either side of the line, there would be a person who is grabbing the boxes off the conveyor lines, examining them, sorting them, stacking them, and putting them on pallets. And so you would spend pretty much the whole shift without really interacting much with, with others. So lots of time for reflection and contemplation. And I'm not one who is readily given to a lot of introspection. But I was, uh, one day as I was there, um, sorting through these boxes and working as quickly as I could because there was a bonus if you, if you worked really fast. And of course, I wanted the bonus. And I just started thinking about my life. I'm not one given to introspection. I'm not one who's given to tears. I'm not one who's given to crying or, or showing emotion all that much anyway. And, and as I was there sorting through those boxes, I began to think about Jesus. And I began to think about all the things in my life where I had seen or I knew Jesus had been active in my life. And before I knew it, 
I was, I don't want to say I was sobbing. I was weeping. Well, that sounds a little aggressive, too. I was crying. There were tears streaming down, down my cheek. Uh, in fact, enough that one of my coworkers came over and asked, are you okay? And I, I said, I'm great. I said, okay, well, if you say so. And they went back to work. But just thinking about what God had done in my life, something touched my heart deeply on a level I've, I've rarely experienced of just knowing, wow, Jesus loves me. See, that's the testimony deep within your heart and mine when we just know. We just know Jesus loves me. And when you and I know that and believe that, then we will find a witness, we will find a testimony that will strengthen our faith in God's word and others will say, there's something I can trust because of the way you and I have experienced Jesus in our lives. Let's trust God and let's share what he has done in your life and mine. Let's stand together as we sing our closing song. It's hymn number 272, Give Me the Bible. And for many, they need to see the Bible, God's word lived out in your life and in mine. Hymn number 272. Hymn 272, the words will be on the screen. I'm wondering, J.D., would you be willing to come up and lead us in that song? I, I hate to put you on the spot, but I know that we will sing the song much more joyfully if you're leading us rather than me. Hymn 272, give me the Bible. We'll sing just the first stanza. Who's, who's going to? I don't think we have a pianist. Okay. Give me the Bible, star of gladness gleaming, to cheer the wonder, lone and tempest tossed. No storm can hide that peaceful radiance beaming. Since Jesus came to seek and save the lost, give me the Bible, holy message shining, thy light shall guide me in the narrow way. Precept and promise, law and love combine, till night shall vanish in eternal day. Sin and grief have filled my soul with fear. Give me the precious words by Jesus spoken. Hold a place lamp to show my Savior near. Give me the Bible, holy message shining. Thy light shall guide me in the narrow way. Precept and promise, law and love combine, till night shall vanish in eternal day. Give me the Bible, all my steps in life, teach me the danger of these realms below. That lamp of safety. given us the Bible, this testimony of Jesus, 
And through the reading of God's word, we can get to know him. But thank you, you've also given us a testimony within ourselves, the experience that we have as we surrender our lives to Jesus. And may we be willing to remember and to share that testimony, that through the lives we live, built upon the sure foundation of God's word, that others would come to believe and trust in Jesus as well, that they would know that God is near, near to each one of us. May that be our experience. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.